with us on the Max on stage. How did you, I think since I got here, you were doing these presentations, <laughs> and I've been learning ever since. So I'm going to let him have as much time as possible. Check him out and uh, definitely enjoy the show. Ladies and gentlemen, Nick Campbell from Grayscale Gorilla. Thank you, Matthias. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, once again, my name is Nick Campbell from Grayscale Gorilla, and we've been helping 3D animators, 3D designers uh, make their best work with our tools, training, and tutorials for over 10 years now. In fact, we're celebrating our 10th year here at NAB as well. It's my 10th time presenting at the Maxon booth, and so thanks to uh, Maxon and their entire team for bringing me here for so long and sharing some of the things we find over the years with you guys and those of you watching online too. So uh, it's a huge year for us, like I said, 10 years. It's been really exciting and a lot has been going on at Grayscale Gorilla as well. My hair has uh, come down a little bit in the last 10 years, um, but we're still doing the same thing, which is teaching what we learn as we learn it to our audience. And we've grown as well. In fact, uh, Chad from Grayscale Gorilla will be presenting here at the booth tomorrow, and I'm excited to see what he brings to the table. So. Um, right before I get started, I also want to direct you to this URL. So grayscalegorilla.com slash NAB. Here you're going to find some of the scene files I'll be using today during my presentation so that you could follow along at home when you get home here. Or uh, uh, if you're watching online, you could download these right away. Uh, we also have 10 materials from our everyday material collection, which I'll be using today and showing off uh, just to give you a little taste of what we've been working on. So. Today, I wanted to show you where I've been in the last six to eight months um, with Cinema 4D and Redshift. Now, I'm really excited that Redshift has joined the Maxon crew, and I can't wait to show you some of the things I've been learning. If you haven't been following along, I recently switched to a PC after being like Mac guy for years, and I think a lot of us are going through this. Uh, but I did it for uh, GPU rendering and Redshift in particular, and I've gotten amazing results by combining Cinema 4D, Redshift, and Grayscale Gorilla tools to really speed up my workflow. And that's what I wanted to show you today, where some of the things that I've made over the last six, eight months since I've got my um, uh, PC, and show you some of the workflows that I've kind of discovered and also learned over the last uh, few months. Everything you're seeing here is created with Cinema 4D, Redshift, and some Grayscale Gorilla tools that I'll show you. And I'm basically going to break down some of these scene files. You may have seen these on Instagram. And of course, the number one uh, kind of request that we get on Instagram is like, hey, can you make a tutorial for this? And so I figured here at NAB will be the perfect place to show you, um, at least open up these scene files and share with you some of the ways that we've created these um, images, but also some ways that you can speed up your workflow. Because to me, it's all about having an idea in your head and quickly getting it out into Cinema 4D, but also onto your screen and into your client's hands or onto your reel as fast as possible. So we're going to be opening some of these scene files today. And if we have time, maybe some requests on some of those that we can go through as well. So who's ready to jump on in to Cinema 4D? And let's get started right now. So let's open up one of my favorites here. Uh, call this one Ham Smash. Uh, I'm going to pause the uh, IPR render uh, down here. This is Redshift. And we're going to be talking about this part of uh, Redshift a lot today. And this is the real-time viewer. This allows us to change our lighting, our materials, our camera, and see at least close to the final result in almost real time. And this, this is what exploded um, my ability to do more animation and, and, frankly, more beautiful animation than I ever could in the past. We're going to be talking about that as well. But let me go ahead and hit play and show you what's going on in this scene. Because I also use some new tools in Cinema 4D R20 to be able to pull off this animation. So um, right here we have a relatively high poly object um, with some soft body dynamics. And if you've ever tried to do soft body dynamics with high poly uh, objects or models, you know that it's, it can be very, very slow. So a common technique is to recreate the model in a low poly cage way, and then use the low poly cage to um, affect the high poly cage. In the past, I had to learn how to freaking model to do that. I don't want to model. I hate modeling. So I found with R20, there's a way easier way to get a low poly cage into Cinema 4D using the volume builder. So I thought I'd go through that process because I've been using this all the time. And if you do soft body dynamics, I think you will too. So we're going to grab the ham here. Let's go ahead and open up a new scene file. And I'm going to paste our um, ham into the scene. And let's make sure it's all in here. 
Let's delete the mesh. That's what's hiding it. So you can do this with any object. Uh, we're going to just recreate our ham here. And the first thing I'm going to do is uh, show you how to create a low poly version of this so that your soft body dynamics will work way, way faster. So for that, we're going to be using the volume builder and the volume mesher. Who's used this so far in R20? All right, this is perfect. Let's learn together. Here we go. So if you want to create a volume, the first thing you need is the volume builder. And you can just dump your object into the volume builder. And instantly, we have a voxel version of our object. This is like a like kind of a Minecraft version of our object. And as we spin around it, you see it kind of pixelizes it, makes it a little lower poly. Well, this is not renderable. This is just for your scene. And you have to put your volume builder in what they call the volume mesher. So you can just add this to your scene, and boom, add it to the volume mesher. Now, I'm going to go to uh, our uh, display here and turn on lines so that you can see the polygons of this object. These are way less polygons in our scene than our high-res uh, version of our object. And so we're already at a place where we can extract this low-poly version and start to mess around with it. So let's do just that. I'm going to go ahead and right-click on our volume mesher. And I'm going to find the right click. There it is. And I'm going to come down to uh, current state to object. And this is going to take exactly what we see and just make it geometry rather than a hierarchy of um, you know, bits and pieces here. And in fact, right now we can turn off this. Uh, and I could do this slowly, turn this off. And we're only going to concentrate on the volume measure. So right now, we're going to turn this into soft body dynamics. This is very simple. Um, Cinema 40 has always been great with dynamics, and they make it really easy. Let's go to our tags. Let's go to simulation tags and go to soft body. And if we go ahead and just go back and hit play, you're going to see it falls out of the frame. In fact, let's just delete this so it's not here. It just falls out of the frame. Well, gravity is still taking hold. Well, this has been around ever since dynamics got started in, in Cinema 40. It's this setting I use. I've been using this for 10 years, folks. Follow position and follow rotation. If you want your object to stick around and act a little bit more MoGraphy and not always fall like gravity, you can just say like 5, 5. And this will kind of keep our object in place. So let's hit play. You can see it falls a little bit, but it's roughly, it wants to stay where it is. All right, well, that's fine. But it's a lot more fun if we could kind of smash this thing around. So let's get a cylinder. And let's move this over. And our cylinder, we're going to come down and say simulation. And we're going to say uh, collider body. And we're going to hit play. And then now we can, boom, we could hit our, our object here. And in, in real time here in the viewport, you can see that we can get some animation going on. Don't hit it too hard. We'll turn up our samples for that later. But you can see we already have what the, the ingredients that we need to then put it in our other object and start to smash it around. Well, of course, this is only half the step because what we really need is the high poly object to be, um, to be affected by the low poly object. So let's go ahead and paste in our ham again. Let's just delete the mesh. We're going to put it back in. But essentially, we want this high poly uh, uh, model to be affected by the low poly one. And you may have seen this in the past, but it's really easy to set up. We can go into our uh, deformers here and come down our, uh, uh, let's see here, the, right there, mesh. So mesh is exactly like it's exactly the icon that we're doing, right? The low poly object into the high poly one. You want to drop your mesh in your hierarchy or make it a child of the object. You actually don't want it up below there. You want it in with all the mesh. Um, and then the last thing we need to do is tell the mesh which low poly object do you want to look at to deform. In fact, there's a little box right here that says cages. We could drop our volume mesher in here. This is our low poly object. And one more thing we have to do before we hit initialize is come down here and say surface. This is one of those things I always do. I, I don't actually know <laughs> what ignore means, but uh, surface is where I always use it. And uh, once it's all set up, you hit initialize. And Cinema 4T takes care of the rest. It hides our low poly object. And basically, uh, essentially, it makes it look like our high poly uh, model is being hit in the same way. In fact, you can see the low poly cage and how it's hitting it. Oh, I hit it too hard again. Be careful, folks, or turn your step frames up. But you can see we have the makings of what we're going to do in our next scene, which is beat this thing up. All right, so all I did at this point was bring it into, um, let's open up our ham slam, and let's make sure it's paused, and let's hit play and see what's happening now. 
So I took exactly what I did with you guys live, and I brought that model into our Smash Rig, which is a bunch of you know basic, simple objects here, all controlled with signal to animate this thing over and over again. This thing has no ending. Signal is animating this, smashing over and over again. And whatever model we put in here through that technique, it'll do exactly that. So the final steps for this was to um, add materials, lighting, and I also baked out our, um, our final soft body dynamics just so if something happened, I could always render one or two frames and fix it down the road. Um, so from here, I just wanted to show you uh, some of the lighting and materials that we've used. Uh, we talked about Everyday Material Collection before. Everyday Material Collection saved my butt when I moved to Redshift, mostly because I didn't want to learn all the parts of Redshift at once. There's a lot going on. We have some Redshift training if you're interested. I started watching that. But I knew that building, you know, building these textures bit by bit was not the, the part of Redshift I wanted to play with right now. So I used our Everyday Material Collection, which is over 300 materials, ready to go with, uh, with Redshift, just drag and drop. So I essentially had this as a gray render. And I would go into uh, the content browser here. And uh, let's see if, uh, make sure we're all installed here. Got EMC Redshift. So this is where I was. Picture this all gray, right? So let's go ahead and take our actual meet and just delete the material. And let's go ahead and turn on our IPR window. And this is what I was talking about with IPR. So let me talk about IPR and Redshift for a second. As we move around our scene, you can see our IPR is updating in almost real time, showing us up-to-date lighting, material, and reflection changes. So now we don't have to hit render to see where we are in our scene. We could just look at our IPR while we're changing our modes here. And Redshift takes care of the rest. So at this point, I was playing around with my camera. Which, which angle of the camera should I have? But more specifically, I was messing around with our lighting and material. So let's go in and try out some other materials. I loved that leather look. But let's go see what else we could do here. Um, of course, we have some car paints. We could come in here and drop car paint red onto this. And you can see what is happening right now is uh, Redshift is basically c converting that material into a material that works really fast on GPU. So it takes a second to see. But once it's in the scene, we can now zoom in and kind of say, is this the look we want to have? And yeah, it's still, that's not as, as nice as the leather was. So we can go back into our organics and start to play with. Maybe it's a different type of leather. We have this nice exotic leather. And this allows me to not have to stop my creative workflow and and start to build my textures with nodes. I think for some people that's great, but for me, I just I want to use materials that are already created and start to drag these in. So this is actually pretty pretty nice. It's, it's kind of like meat. If we zoom in, we got a lot of detail here on our our material. And so let's zoom back out and see what the last piece was for this piece of animation. Well, of course, lighting is a huge part of uh, any render. We've been talking about lighting here at Grayscale Gorilla for the last 10 years. And it was the dawn that it was, the, it was realizing that lighting was the most important part of making your scene feel the way you wanted it to feel. There's so much emotion that we can bring into our animations. And all of it has to do, for me at least, with the lighting of the scene. You know that you can make something extra bright. It's a little bit more fun and kid friendly. Or you can make it really dark and moody. And lighting is a huge part of that. So really quickly, and we'll show more of this later, but uh, we use a Redshift dome light. You can go up to Redshift here, and they have their own lights here. But if you want to use an HDR, um, this is where I used our, our uh, HDRI link. And this allows you to choose from uh, over 600 lighting situations inside of uh, Redshift and Cinema 4D um, instantly. So right now, we can go in here and say, let's go to Pro Studios Metal, which is one of my favorite packs. And we could click on it. And you can see over in the uh, IPR window, we get a totally different lighting setup. And in fact, I can go to Advanced and say Preview. And this will speed up that process even more. I don't like that one much. Let's go ahead and click this one. No, let's click this one. Now we're talking. And we could also even come in and start to rotate this around to get different looks. And what I love about Redshift is now you can play with materials and lighting in real time. And I can look, literally look down at my IPR and rotate this around 
until it looks good. In fact, let's zoom in because this leather material is so nice. I could, I'm literally grabbing my dome light with HDRI link on it, rotating it around until it looks exactly what I want. Maybe we want more of a backlight situation like that. That's looking nice. Let's zoom out and we're looking good, we're ready to render. Okay, so that is a little bit of the workflow um, of some of this. So let's head on into another one. This one's um, you know, simple to look at. Uh, what's really nice about this one is there's a lot going on in this scene as far as animation, but the hierarchy, you can see there's not a lot in our scene here. So I wanted to break this one down. You saw it on the reel. Let's just hit play and look at what's going on here. Well, we have our sphere. Anybody remember the game Marble Madness? I love that game. I was like something about that thing, like dominoes and marble madness. Like that game spoke to me. And so I was playing around with some of these looks. And I was like, let's make a little marble madness thing. We'll have the marble rolling around. But I don't want to have to animate all this by hand. Let's try to set up some procedural way to allow our marble to roll around this landscape and you put some parameters in and then hit play and see what the heck happens. I love that feeling. Cinema 4 makes, Cinema 4D makes it really easy to do it. And I wanted to show you how I use some features in R20 um, and then, of course, Redshift to get our final render here. So let's zoom out. I'm going to unclick on Gorilla Cam. We might talk about that in a second. But let me just go to a regular old camera. And let's look up and see what's going on in this scene. So you can see we have a plane. We have some geometry that's being deformed on the plane. And then we have this camera that is, uh, let me just turn off our atom array for a second. It might r run a little bit faster. And then we have this camera that is following our sphere around. And this is an important part of the effect because the sphere is rolling on its own. So we have a plane that's tilted on its side. We have some dynamics that allow the, just like we showed before, we have the, some rigid body dynamics in this case that allows the sphere to roll around and kind of it wants to follow gravity. And then, of course, it gets in the way when all these little pieces of de deformation get in its way. And then the missing piece there is I didn't want to have to animate my camera to follow my dynamic uh, sphere. So instead, we use Gorilla Cam, which is another Grayscale Gorilla plugin that allows you to do a ton of stuff. Um, but mostly what I'm doing it with this one is add some natural shake and allows me to target my object. And then what's nice is it doesn't just lock in as a target as a regular target on a camera would. There's natural, almost like a, a real person is behind the camera and the marble will move fast. And then the cameraman's like trying to, to keep up with it. It's built to have natural camera movement. So all these things combined, very simple elements in Cinema 4D to create what is a really engaging animation. I love this stuff. Um, and so let's go through, break through the hierarchy, other elements that we have in the scene. And then we're going to open up a different version of the scene. And I'm going to talk to you about R20 and uh, fields and how I use fields with that. So you can see we have our plane. We have our displacer. On top of our displacer, we have a noise. And all this displacer is doing is animating this noise going up, just like that. And uh, you're seeing, let me turn off these other ones. Flat plane, displacer is now engaging parts of our um, geometry. And in fact, we can go into our noise and uh, change the scale of our noise and get different types of animations here. And the way that it's animated is right here, animation speed. If you haven't played with animation speed and noise, I use that setting all the time get you up and running with animated noise without having to set any keyframes. All right, so that's one piece of it. We also have, uh, let me undo uh, some things and make sure we're back to where we were. We also have an atom array that's doing the exact same thing except with an atom array, which gives us these nice little pieces of um, filigree kind of, what am I just trying to say, like a, a little piping around each polygon. Um, so this just helps give it a little bit more of that marble madness feel with like the lines going through it. Of course, we have our dynamics tag on our sphere. We have a dynamics tag on our plane. And I lean, the, the, the entire rig is on a tilt null that, uh, if you just look, it's got a couple degrees tilt on it so that the marble just naturally wants to roll. Well, once we had all that, I don't know what banana was. What was I thinking? What was banana, folks? Oh, I think I was going to do a marble, like literal clear marble, and put an object inside of it. And I decided at the last minute, it kind of looked better as like a, a gumball than a marble. OK, so like, we could delete banana. Hey, fun, even smaller scene file, folks. I love this. So you can see what we have right now is um, the, the original input camera is just this. This is kind of how I framed my shot. 
I was like, this is how far I want my camera to be away from it. And then, of course, when I hit play, um, the camera does not follow it. And of course, like I said, we could put a tag on our camera to, um, to lock in on our object, but that'll literally track it pixel by pixel, and it'll look a little bit unnatural. So instead, I turned it into a Gorilla Cam, and I came up here into Gorilla Cam into our uh, target mode, and I dropped the sphere into the target mode. And down here, you have some settings like overshoot fade, overshoot target, and this tells you basically how drunk the cameraman is. You know what I mean? Like how slow will the camera try to follow along? And the, lower, the more you lower that down, the more tightly focused he'll like, grab onto your object. Um, so I use this all the time. It's also adding some natural uh, wiggle in our main Gorilla Cam tag here. You see it's not a lot, but we have some rough camera shake or some, some smooth <laughs> camera shake to add it in. And then, of course, at the, end of, at the end of everything, I reach for my two favorite tools, which is Everyday Material Collection and um, uh, HDRI Link to light it and add materials. The materials are pretty simple in this case, but I will show you the lighting just because it's, such, it's so fun to look at the lighting and rotate your scene around and see what it looks like. Uh, now, I'm, we, it looks like I have some subdivision surface I didn't have on before. There we go. And uh, here is our dome light. Same thing. It has uh, HDRI. Um, let me move this over here. There we go. So it has HDRI link here. And again, we could just click on different scenes. And it will update in our viewport. Nah, that, one, that one's not my favorite. Yeah, that's OK. Let's go ahead and change something like Road Trip. These are some of my favorites, films from all over the US, beautiful lighting situations I find myself in. I would pull out my camera and capture them so that I could use them in Cinema 4D later. I like this one with the sky, but I think it has to have a little bit more mood. But this is why we created this tool, so that you can choose between all of these different lighting sources and click until it looks good. Because sometimes I don't know. Sometimes I don't know exactly the lighting I need until I see it. That looks pretty good. Let's brighten it up. Let's go into our dome light. Go to general. Zoom down here. And crank up our exposure just a bit. Maybe a little more. There we go. And you could do that to set all this up. So with that in mind, I got done with this animation. And I was like, I think there's more we could do with this effect. Like, it was so compelling to me that we got so much done with so little um, parts of Cinema 4D that I was like, what? wonder if we could do more with Fields. Fields was uh, still a little bit new to me back when I got my PC. I was playing with Redshift. So I was like, Let's let, me, let me try to learn more about Fields. And so I wanted to show you this scene because it's similar to the last one, but it adds on top of it some Fields. So who's played around with the new Fields uh, in R20? There's more of you than that. Thank you. So um, Fields is a way that you can animate, you can affect objects, geometry, in a really um, interesting way that, w at first glance, you might look at it and go, there's a lot going on here. But once you start to understand what Fields uh, can do, you, it'll start to open up parts of your um, uh, creativity and animation, ways that you can animate without having to go in and set keyframes for everything. OK, so here's a really similar scene. We have a sphere bouncing around. We have our gorilla cam making the natural movement. Our sphere, of course, because I love spheres. I love shiny spheres. Still do, 10 years in the making. They're also kicking off other spheres, because why not add more? And it's also affecting the ground. Now, what's really key is that this object is telling the ground what to do. We did not have to tell the ground and animate all this stuff to happen. We essentially told the ground that whenever this object, in this case a sphere, is close to you, we want you to do something. And, that, and these fields are telling the ground what to do. Okay, So think of it that way. If you haven't used it, let's, let's kind of back up here and see what we have in our scene. So let's go in and look at our displacer. Let's turn that off. So it, literally right now, ignore everything else. Just look at the plane. We have our big plane again, same setup as last time. We have our displacer. Now, our displacer, if I turn off the shader field, is uh, uh, essentially turning everything up. Okay? What our sh shader field is going to do, let's go into our shader field and go, I'm sorry, go into our displacer and go to our fall off, thank you, and then turn on and off all these objects. Okay, so you can see frame zero is kind of weird. Like, why is the sphere under the, the, um, 
uh, scene. Well, our, our shader and our displacer is cranking up our floor. And all of this is, is telling, so let's turn off displacer. All of our displacer is doing is telling the entire set of geometry to go up. There's, here's, this, here's the limit of how high you can go. So let me show you where that is. When you add a displacer, you put it in the hierarchy under a plane. You go to shading, you add color. And we, in this case, it's just white. And if we go into something like object, you can control how high this displacer is moving your object. OK, very simple, but not very interesting uh, stuff going on here yet. OK, but as soon as we add uh, fields, we can start to control where we want our geometry to go up. So let's go into our fall off. In fall off is where, you're f where you will find your fields palette. And in this case, I added three uh, sets of, of fields. The first thing I did was I literally dropped in my sphere. And I didn't know you could do this until um, a few months ago where I was playing more with fields. You could take any piece of geometry and add it as a field. So I grabbed my sphere, and I dragged it in, and it made this. Okay? It allowed, it allowed me to say, wherever the sphere is, I want you to influence what this displacer is doing. And so if we go into the sphere, let me move this down. First of all, I turn it in point mode. So all the points of my sphere are affecting the floor. I also, you can affect the radius. So literally right now, let's just leave it kind of where it was here. And let me hit play, and you can see what's happening. Uh, we have our radius of our object, and this is baked animation. This is why it's not reacting the way I want. Let's go ahead and clear the cache. Oh, it's, the sphere is acting as if it's just reading the, the cached information. So let me just shift click on this. I'm going to go to cache and say clear all caches. Let me back up. Let me hit play. And now it's doing what I want. So now our sphere is doing the same thing it was doing before, <laughs> but it's getting well too close to the camera. Um, it just rolled off the edge, folks. Let's back up. Let's see what's going on. OK, that's, this will be more clear. So our sphere is literally telling our floor, wherever I am, I want you to start raising up. And because of dynamics, the floor is also like, I'm going to move you. Like, I'm going to bump up into you and knock you off uh, the ground here. So what can we do to keep him not from rolling off the edge? Well, one thing we could do is add a copy of that sphere. And so let's go into our fall off and our fields. Let's turn on uh, subtract. So now I'm using the exact same sphere, but it's also making a smaller indentation on the top of it. So we're getting closer. See that? See, it's got more of like a little tabletop piece to it. So I'm thinking, OK, that'll keep it from rolling as much. It's still flat, so it's still falling. But now what I want to do is create a little bit of, of a cage around it to keep it from just rolling and falling off the edge. And I also want this cage to be moving. I want, I want little things to go, come up and bounce this ball around. So the third thing I added was a shader field. And inside of the shader field, I put a noise. It's just like you saw in the last uh, Marble Madness thing where the whole thing was noise. But instead, I limited it to only where this was popping up. And the way that I did that was I used the blending modes. So this is where fields can look like, holy crap, what are these blending modes doing? But essentially, if I just set this to normal, then, uh, th then this um, sh shader field is moving the entire um, playground around. But I don't want that. I only want this shader field to affect the, the other effectors, essentially. So I'm going to come in here and go to Overlay. And now we're getting what we wanted. Some of this was experimentation, which Cinema 4D is a huge part of like, ex experimenting and playing with this. But these blending modes make it super powerful. So now our sphere is saying, hey, wherever I am, I want you to move up. I want you to give me a little flat piece. And I want you to include this noise. And I could do things like speed up this noise to affect these, you know, affect the sphere even more. So let's come on in to our uh, speed. We have animation speed. And let's just set this to three and see how different this is. I have a feeling it's going to fling this thing around <laughs> even more. So there you go. So now we're getting crazy bouncing around. And I could even go into our uh, project settings and go into our dynamics and say, hey, I want the time scale to be, uh, e let's go slower. Let's go 50%.
And so now when it bounces, it's going to feel a little bit larger. The scene is going to feel bigger. In fact, it's bouncing it around too much and falling off the ground. But those are all the pieces that come together and allow me to essentially, <laughs> essentially look down in my world and say, how do I want my world to, what are the rules for my world? Well, in this case, we have gravity. I want those rules to, to be as real as possible. We have these effectors. We have all these dynamics and spheres. We want our camera to have a little bit of, of uh, you know, automation to it and tell our camera what to do. And then, and then I want to hit play and see what the heck happens. And then you end up with this kind of result. And we can come in here and just look at the final piece for that one. And then you end up with something like this, which I, I could never animate this by hand, right? Animating this by hand would take so long. Um, and it's, it would be a little boring to animate by hand as well. But now our camera is following along naturally using Gorilla Cam. We have materials with the same as before. I won't go through the lights and, and uh, materials again. But same as before, I used our checkerboard material and our, our HDRI link to create these lights and get exactly this. All right, so let's jump into another one. And let's, let's jump into, so this will be a quick one. This will kind of introduce the concept, and then we could jump into another one as well. Let me back up and show you this render here. So um, I was playing with something new that we're coming out with soon, which is this dust pack. And I was like, what, how can we like, show this off and show it in the camera move and get all these nice depth of field effects. And I was like, squirt gun, that's cool. So we had this amazing squirt gun, super soaker kind of thing from our uh, Happy Toolbox model pack. I brought it in. Who remembers the super soaker? Who had the yellow one? Yeah, this is it, dude. This is the one. Who was like, who had the rich parents when they had the blue one? Jerks. Who is that? Raise your hand. I'm gonna show yourself. All right, the backpack. Screw those kids, man. All right, here's the thing. So. I brought this model in, and then I brought all these dust elements in, and I, I was instantly blown away from like, okay, this, this, this changed the way I was thinking about dust, right? Um, not only could we bring in these dust elements, which are pre-baked, uh, pre-animated, ready to go, ready to render dust, but they also work with camera animation, and they really like gave this scene some, some like life to it. Um, let's just look at it without it. Let's go turn off our dust here, two sets of dust. And then let me also turn off our, um, our dome light. Let's leave dome light on, because that's our HDR. And let's talk about environment and area light. OK, so I just, what I mostly wanted to do is break this scene down light by light. Because you can see it's a pretty simple scene. Um, we have our object that was all, all the plastic is from Everyday Material Collection, looks beautiful. Um, won't go over that again. but. I also have Gorilla Cam doing a little bit of animation. And I wanted a lot more kind of atmosphere. I wanted this to feel like it, like it would be a cool, badass render, but it's kind of not because it's a squirt gun, right? So I wanted to mix the two kind of vibes and come on here, and I started adding Redshift Environment. Now, if you haven't played with Redshift Environment, um, it's really simple to use. All you have to do is add a redsh Redshift Environment, and, and the numbers in all these you don't have to change these numbers very high. In fact, if I turn this up too high, uh, let me turn on my light, it'll just like start to blow things out. But in, in, essentially, I have a redshift environment, and then I have an area light. And then the only other thing I have to do is tell my area light inside a volume that I want it to contribute. Say, how much do I want you to contribute? Zero. We're back to just plain black. That's no fun. And so as we raise this up, it's going to contribute more and more to the scattering of the environment. These numbers are actually really small. Like you can go 0 0.1, 0 0.01, and sometimes that is exactly enough. Like that's literally 0.01. It's very, very like sensitive, but it's really beautiful, and it allows you to light your scene and give it instant atmosphere. Well, so then I thought, okay, this that has some atmosphere. Maybe it's a little bright. What else can we do? Well, we have these dust elements that are coming out soon. Um, let's see if, how this works. This is kind of the first time I use this in a workflow, and I literally I brought one in. And I started scaling them around, because when it came in, it was a little small. That dust was not very compelling to me. <laughs> so I scaled it up. I was like, at least it should hit the camera. And then I was like, that's looking better. Now I have the depth of field on my camera. So let's look at that on any camera, by the way. Let me start from, let me start from scratch, because I haven't done that enough in this presentation. I love doing that. On any camera, if you're using Redshift and you want depth of field, it's this easy. You uh, come into your tags, 
you go to Redshift Tags, you go to Redshift Camera, and you go to Boca, turn on Override, turn on Enabled, and right here, this is basically your blur setting. The COC radius, you turn this up or down, and you're going to get beautiful, um, uh, beautiful bokeh on your object. In fact, as we get closer to the gun here, let's like, turn this on and off and see without, without depth of field, it's OK. It looks nice. It's good plastic. But man, when you start to get dust combined with depth of field and good materials, you start to really get some amazing effects. And so I instantly was like, well, that's great. Let me just pause this render so we could see it in the viewport. My favorite thing about this was like, OK, I have all this. Usually when I add dust, it's on an overlay on After Effects. And that looks good. But what I miss is when your camera flies through it, you miss all those like motion blur effects and like whipping past the camera. And I was instantly like, awesome. I loved it so much, I added more. So <laughs> I added another set of dust here, played with the depth of field, played with the lighting. You've seen the end of this uh, many times already. But I dialed it all in and got what I thought was something I could never make before. Um, honestly, like before I had Redshift and my new PC and all these other tools and dust, um, I, I literally could not have made a, a render like this. And so let me just show you the final render here. I'm going to go to our desktop, and it'd be my name. There we go. Final renders. And like literally, the, the quality of the depth of field, the quality of the textures, the camera rig, which we didn't even talk about, but very simple camera rig um, using Signal and Gorilla Cam, um, all came together to create something like I've never been able to do. Same with this. So let's jump into this one. I think we have time for this. Um, let's go ahead and open up the NAB title sequence. We have this type of scene file, which I find myself making this. Man, I've made this type of animation for over 10 years. Clients love it. Um, you know, people learning Cinema 4D love it. They, you could type anything into it and instantly have a like sexy title card that just looks great. Now, I've been making a variation of this for so long that I started to make a template for this. Um, and I recommend you guys do this as well. Anything you make over and over again, try not to start from scratch. This may sound obvious, but it took me a long time to, to, to think through this. I now have a metal title sequence that I open and start from. Because what I've built over the years is a way to, to build this animation, change the background, change the material, of maybe change the font, and essentially remake this title for different uh, friends of mine, different clients, people asking about it, different tutorials. And I can get drastically different looks just by turning on and off different things in a scene. So rather than start from scratch, I'm basically opening a little Lego kit that I'm smashing things together until it looks the way I want. It allows me to work fast. And that's really the goal of, of what I'm trying to show you today is the ability to have an idea or have a client ask for something and say, I know exactly what you need, and I have a way to do it quickly to make it look good, to make it render fast, and to get it out the door and get another job or to make someone happy. That's why we do this stuff. So I wanted to break down this scene file um, because it's got a lot of ways that you can co combine things together. Let me close this down. Let's go ahead and open up Metal Title Sequence. So you're going to see this is essentially where we are. This is essentially what you saw in, uh, in the final render. Um, and there's a lot of elements into it. And what I love about this is you can mix and match these things depending on your client. Now, if you have, you know, if you're doing something for the Oscars, let's say, they might want something more like this, like, you know, fairy dust and really dark and kind of like majestic, kind of like beautiful. Um, but you also might have a client that's like, look, I want it more moody and dark. Uh, you may want something like with a white background that's, that isn't metal, a lot more plasticky, a lot more fun, maybe kid friendly. But this will allow you, setting up scenes like this will allow you to do all of those things without having to start from scratch. So I wanted to break down some of the some of the ways we built this scene and also show you, you know, in general how I think through these problems so that you can start to build your preset scene files and use uh, things like Redshift and Grayscale Gorilla tools to like speed up the fun creative part of the workflow and leave all the technical stuff behind when you don't need it. Okay, so let's first of all look at the environment. We just talked about that. I'm going to turn off our dust as well. So you can see as I start to turn things off, we're going to lose some of the atmosphere, but we still do have these incredible lights. 
Let's turn off our top area light. Let's turn off our bottom area light. You can see those were contributing a lot of the uh, kind of atmosphere to our scene. However, we still do have our nice metal type. And let's go ahead in there. And this is always uh, a lot of fun. What do we want this to say? I mean, NAB 2019 is fun, but it's more fun to like see your name on screen. Yell out first name that gets it or, or word. Let me hear it. What's that one? Say, spell that one. Mason. Dude, thank you, Mason. That's, you know what? I love you, Mason, because that is like the perfect size <laughs> for all this. Uh, M. Let's see. Cap lock on. There you go. Classic. Look at that. I don't even have to change the scale too much. Let's go into our font, and let's see what we got here. We can, uh, Mason, what kind of font are you as a person? You know what I mean? <laughs> no, don't make me do papyrus, please. Well, let's find something. Uh, you, you're, a, you're a troublemaker. That's what you are as a font. Uh, this looks pretty fun. This looks fun. Let's, let's scale this out. Vertical spacing. Let's, uh, or I'm sorry, horizontal spacing. Let's open this up a little bit. And you can see now, I'm going to turn off our viewport and just kind of talk about our animation real quick. So what we have in this scene is um, we have our effector rolling through the scene. We have that really typical like 90 degree type that is all kind of flat and then it reveals the name. That's fun. Um, but of course we can go change all that. Because this is all set up, I don't have to recreate that from scratch. I could come into our linear field and specifically into our plane effector, go to effector, parameter. You can see this is 90 degrees. Let's, let's kind of cut halfway through and say, OK, well, instead of 90 degrees that way, what if it flips this way as well? And so now we have a different look, right? And now you could start to separate this look and m not have it be the same all the time. I should probably be an even number, like 90. <laughs> you could add random effectors to have it do in different directions. Uh, of course, we can also do things like scale. If we set scale to negative 1, let's go ahead and do that. This will actually scale in from nothing. So now instead of having something there, it'll just kind of scale in bit by bit. And of course, we could also do something opposite and have giant text <laughs> that falls in. Um, all this is with one rig. All we have done is changed some numbers. And of course, we could do it with position as well and say, OK, let's fall in from the top. So now our client could say, hey, what I really want is like our name to fall down or our logo to come in. And you could bring their logo into the scene, type their name in, type in maybe a little title sequence for someone, you know, so the, the director's name and say, what about something like this without having to always start from scratch? All right, so let's call that a win. Let's say it's coming from, wait, I've got to check with Mason. Mason, you good with this? Like falling in from the top? You've got to be a little angry as like, hey, Mason, be a jerk client to me. That's really what I need. Like you've seen, you've seen these jerk clients. Yeah. Uh, I don't like the, uh, color. You don't like the color on it? <laughs> Dude, thank you. I'll pay you later, Mason. We're going to use uh, uh, our everyday material collection. Thank you. So. Um, right now, we have a really simple metal on it. It's going to catch our reflections really nice, but maybe we want this a little bit brighter. Let's go into our plastics. These are all pre-made, and they're not just glossy materials. These have things like thumbprints and scratches and natural things on them that make it catch light in a different way. And all you have to do is drag it in, um, and uh, Redshift will turn it into uh, a GPU-friendly type of uh, material. And we turn on our IPR window. It's going to process that texture. And we should see any moment now our blue texture coming in. Of course, we can come in and change the color of that. We may need to brighten up our logo. But we essentially have um, uh, our, our material coming in. Let's go with maybe red? I don't know. Let's see what red looks like. This resin is always a fun one because it's really kind of translucent and uh, really bright. It's processing. Eh, I guess it's darker than I thought. Let's go back to maybe blue. Blue or green, Mason? Green. green. I like this like sea foamy kind of green color. Let's bring this in. Processing texture. And we're ready to go. All right, we may have to brighten up our stuff, but we, we got some nice stuff going on here. The next thing I would do is go change our lighting. We could do that really easily, again, using HDRI link and our browser. We can click through different um, looks here. Let's go ahead and turn it on preview mode just to speed it up. And then during render, you can turn it on full mode and make sure you have full resolution. This allows me to quick click very quickly and get different looks. In fact, what I think we need here is some sort of 
outdoor paradise kind of thing. Maybe some gr nice green colors. This one's nice. We do have to make it a little bit brighter. Let's go into our dome light. Go to general and turn up the exposure. Already we're getting some nice looks. Okay, so now let's talk about adding a little bit of environment. We could change the background color, but for me what's more fun is we can actually go add our redshift environment, add an area light. This one is just above our, our scene here. And then again, you go into volume, turn on your contribution scale, and you can turn it up and get atmosphere. You can get color, you can get mood in your scene, and you can pick what color you want just by changing the top area light. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tone this back down. We're going to get more subtle with it. And um, it's, uh, it's my favorite Will Smith rap song. Getting subtle. With it. So colors, we got pink. Nah, it's not quite a pink vibe. We got that green type. We can go ahead and get green. And then we can also contribute something from the bottom as well. A little bit of, little bit of heat maybe, a little bit of red. Kind of balance it out. And so now we have some atmosphere, just like we saw in the last one. And then, of course, we have all these dust. Now, we could just render this out without it. And in fact, we could talk about the camera animation before we uh, start adding dust and all that. Right now, you can see if we just hit play, we get boom. We get that. It's looking good. We can maybe change you know, the speed of all this, but let's say we're happy with that. Um, but we want our camera animation to be a little bit more uh, dynamic. Well, in this case, I'm using a Signal camera rig. Uh, if you have Signal, you can go download this rig for free. And what, it, I've, what I did was I created camera moves that I use all the time. Um, especially for these types of title sequences, there's essentially like these sets of camera moves. Either zoom out and then keep drifting back. Always looks good. That's what we're doing here. So let me just hit play and talk about these different moves. So when you have a camera and you zoom way out and then you just, it just stops, you kind of lose some of that movement. It always looks better if you're drifting back as after you're done pulling your camera away. And so I found myself doing that. It was never super easy to, to animate. So I built a rig to do just that. Well, and then I said, well, I also sometimes fly in from the side. Like I want to reverse, you know, fly in like an orbit camera and then reveal the logo like swiping in, almost like NFL style, like big logo kind of thing. So I made an orbit node as well. And as you crank up the orbit, um, you, can, you can rotate around. So let's go ahead and turn this um, up here. There it is. So we can crank this up and now hit play. And you can see we're rotating around. Now, if you're, let me just turn off the uh, linear field here. You can see if we turn off the animation that now we have this flying in from the logo side. And if we turn off, let's say, let's go zero out this and this for now and just do a, 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 like a Y rotation. Or no, this one's coming up from, uh, from the bottom. Let's make that more drastic. Now we're flying in from the bottom. We have a completely different look. And all the atmosphere is going to add on to all this stuff. Um, so it's nice we could ask the client, which, which way would you like the camera to fly in from? Like, uh, make it epic. <laughs> make it epic. Classic client BS, dude. Make it epic. Dude, you're killing it. Thank you. That was awesome. Make it epic. What does that mean? All right, you got it. Say yes. That's all you have to say to the client. You got it, boss. This is going to be epic. Let's fly in from the side here and kind of start in close. And like we could even speed this up and say, I want that move to go a little bit faster. Um, and we could do that in a second. Let's, let's move into our dust. You could see, um, you know, this is perfect. Your client says a word like epic. You're like, ah, let me show you epic. Uh, let's get some dust involved. Now, again, these are pre-baked uh, dust files. We're going to have these on our site really soon. I've been using the heck out of them because with depth of field, um, and the things that need a lot more atmosphere, a lot more like of that epic vibe. Like it's such a great thing to add to tell your client like, hey, we added some dust to make it more epic, man. Like look at all this stuff. So what we have here are three different types of dust. Let's talk about each one really quick because they each contribute just a little bit different thing. Um, again, these are pre-rendered, pre-animated, so you can bring them in your scene and they just show up ready to go. Um, in this case, I added a material to it that is uh, an incandescent redshift material. All that means is it's a material that has its own lighting, like a light bulb. And so I added uh, an incandescent reddish orange material to our uh, particles here, uh, to our, um, our dust, and I put it just below the camera. 
And then over time, if I kind of go back to the beginning, it's going to be lower in the frame. And then over time, it kind of rises up like, like, like embers from a fire. What's more epic than embers from a fire, client? Right? Let's go. The next one is basic random. Uh, and actually, this is just the same one duplicated twice. I think one is closer to the camera and one is further away. One to give you some smaller particles in the back and one to add these nice little bokeh balls in the front. Did everybody see that on that screen? Is that visible? It can be a subtle effect, but that's kind of what you're going for. You're adding these 10% subtle effects like atmosphere and dust to take what really is a simple um, uh, text animation and adding that epic to it, adding that move to it. And of course, the last thing we did here was add Gorilla Cam. Let me turn off our IPR so we could see this uh, just in the viewport. And you see how the logo isn't just stable, it's kind of floating around. Let me exaggerate it a little bit. In fact, we have a button in here that'll do just that. Let's click on Gorilla Cam and let's come on down to um, uh, let's come on down to what do we have time to show today. Well, let's just talk about our presets for just a second because this is where you could take what is really some simple, you know, moving uh, animate like some simple key or non keyframed um, animation for your text adding in those elements through uh, the dust and the atmosphere using Redshift, but then taking something like the camera, which can be really tricky to animate, using a rig that's already built, and then Gorilla Cam that allows you to add natural camera shake. So the last little part of this uh, thing is to, man, you could sit with the client and do this and say, hey, there's some presets in here I wanted to show you. Let's get aggressive. Let's get to cinematic, right? Let's use words like cinematic and epic and say, you know, we can do, uh, something along the lines of like bumpy road. Let's see what that looks like. Okay, well that road is a little bit too epic, a little bit too bumpy for me. One thing we can do is lower the scale of our scene. If we go to a coffee cup scale, you're gonna see it's gonna keep it more in frame, but we can all agree uh, that is a little too bumpy of a road. Let's go to subtle shake. Subtle shake is gonna be a little bit better. Again, a little bit too much there. Let's go ahead and turn down our uh, input smoothing. Let's do our overshoot and turn all that off and make it more subtle and say, uh, that's not quite right either. And let's, let's maybe, we may have to move out of our cinematic uh, effects here because those are a little bit crazy. That's actually not bad. If we tone that down and we could do that really easily just by toning down our position and rotation intensity, that's kind of epic, right? That might be the vibe they're going for like fast and furious, Mason. Is that your vibe? Are you more like chilled? Fastest and cheapest. That's the new franchise we need to work on. That's good. So that's a little bit of um, you know, some of the things uh, and some of the ways that I've been using these tools. I'm really excited specifically to have um, Redshift be a part of the Maxon community. When I, got my, um, when I got my PC and I started learning all this stuff, it was kind of the obvious answer from everyone I talked to, start to learn Redshift. Um, I, and it just so happened we had our Redshift training that just launched. It was perfect timing. I started watching that, started learning, and started to bringing these things into um, some of the techniques that I've been using for years and years in other renderers. Instantly started working in Redshift, but way faster, way more intuitive, and literally was able to help me do things that I didn't think I was able to do by combining Cinema 4D, Redshift, and some of our Grayscale Gorilla tools. That's entirely what I wanted to do, was speed up my workflow, be able to take what was in my head or my client's head, get it on screen, and to get it rendered and on, you know, on Frame.io or on my reel as fast as possible. And that's our goal here at Grayscale Gorilla, and I uh, just wanted to thank Maxon for making such amazing tools, excited to have Redshift, and I wanted to thank you so much for joining me today here at the Maxon booth. Thanks again. <laughs> Bye, Internet. Thanks for watching.